up in that blood, that sacrifice that you made for us, Jesus. We're so grateful to you, Lord. going to start out in prayer. Lord, I thank you for uh, everything you did with Scott in the Philippines, all the doors and new doors that you opened, Lord. I ask that uh, just more and more doors get opened over there as we know that is his heart and that is the heart of New Hope City Church in Longview and it is the desire of New Hope International Church with Margie that you open doors to free the people of the Philippines. We ask that we are able to share your love to anyone that we can in any open door anywhere. We thank you for Scott's heart to serve and Jeannie's heart to, to let him serve, for the heart of New Hope City Church to allow him to serve. Lord, we ask that as he returns home that you bless him with rest, and as the, the trip is long and weary, we ask that you keep him healthy as he's going to be here next week and, and sharing what you did in the Philippines with him in the last several weeks. Lord, as we gather here this morning, we just ask that your presence be amongst us thickly today as it was through worship, and I ask you to continue through the word. As you have been here all along, we just ask for more of you, Lord. I ask for more of you, that there be less of me, that your words be heard, that your name be lifted high, that your glory shine. Lord, I thank you again for this opportunity to be a vessel in which you can share a word. I ask that it reaches reaches ears that are not deaf and eyes that, cannot, that it can see. I ask that you continue to speak to the body of New Hope in whatever way that you need it spoken. Lord, through the many speakers that you use to speak it. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, Jerry spoke, and I want to thank you for a good word, Jerry. It was the right partakers of a divine nature. Good word. It's always, always 
wonderful to hear you. I, I always take pleasure in it. He spoke out of Second Peter 1, 3 through 4. If you weren't here, here for it, I would recommend listening to it online. If you don't get online, you can also get CDs. And one of the things that I love about the way the Lord works is I remember when Jerry talked about it, I believe it was May of 2017, and I was so amped when he talked about it then. And, and the fact that the Lord's bringing it back around a year later, is it, it, at first it makes me say, Lord, what did I miss? And he told me, you didn't miss anything. I'm just reminding you. Because one of the things Jerry spoke about the most is our identity. And one of the things the Lord has spoke continuously since I've been to New Hope in, I believe we've been here seven years this month. Yes? Seven years this month. And one of the things he's continually talked about in the seven years since Jill and I have came here is our identity. And it's not that we continually lose our identity or, or that the enemy is continually attacking it, but I believe both those things. I believe that the Lord needs to frequently remind me of who I am because I so often forget how the Lord sees me. And it's very easy when Jerry t spoke out of, out of 1 Corinthians 13. We, we all know the verse, love is patient, love is kind. And the fact that, that, that the name of God is love, it's one of his char characteristics throughout the Bible. It actually says that love is who he is. It is how he is defined. So when Jerry says, put God's name in there, oh yeah, that's easy. Love is, God is, I can do that. When he says, you are. I, it's easy for me to say, Doug, you are love. And when, when he taught about this in May of 2017, it blew my mind back then. And, and I remember getting up, I believe I taught after you that time too. Oh, Scott's always gone this time of year, isn't he? And, and I remember getting up and challenging the body of New Hope to, to put these words on paper. And when you put it, put your name in there, as Jerry said, I am. Because when I'm reading through these things, one of the enemy does, as I'm reading through these, it says, no, you're not. When, when I put my name in there, I am patient. Ooh, I might not have been so patient this morning with my wife. Ooh, I might not have been so kind when I talked to my daughter. And the enemy's so quick to remind you of those circumstances that you're not, you're not, you weren't, you haven't been. You can never be. You're not jealous. Oh, I might have failed that one too. Oh. You're not boastful. Not today. <laughs> You're not proud. No, I was yesterday. Maybe I will be tomorrow. As we go down this list, I feel like when Jerry was saying it last week, I could feel my head going lower and lower and lower because the enemy was bombarding me with all these circumstances in my life that I haven't been. And he's still trying to convince each and every one of us that we can't be it today and we won't be it tomorrow. When we should be saying we are a new creature, we have been covered in the blood of Christ, we are these things. Even if I fail at it today and even if I fail at it tomorrow, the Lord renews me daily. He renews you daily. And, and, and because, because of speaking on identity, it's also what I spoke about last time I, I was up here two weeks ago when I uh, did the smoke-free teaching out of Daniel 3 uh, about the fiery furnace. And I'm going to continue with that today, and that's, uh, today is going to be part two of that. And, and it got kicked off. I'm not going to spend a lot of time rehashing what I talked about two weeks ago, because I'm pretty sure I was clear, and most people were here. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on a few things and take about maybe two to five to 20 minutes. <laughs> we're not sure yet where God's going, okay? But it all, it all stemmed from uh, Scott's teaching when he got up here, and he, he was teaching out of Genesis 37, and he titled The Purpose of the Pit. And he told us before he left for the Philippines that he was going to come back and finish this up. So I'm sure he's going to recall us and remember what he taught on with that and we're going to move on to probably part two three four five i don't know what what he's doing with that but but the purpose of the pit with joseph we all know that joseph went through all these circumstances and difficult opportunities he's got a horde of brothers that threw him in the pit and wanted to kill him and scott's saying that through these circumstances in our life through all these going ons through all these attacks we're all going to have pits and Mickey got up here afterwards and, and talked about, about uh, 
Well, I'm, I'm going to go to the tail end of it. I'm not going to rehash everything. But he started talking about uh, the afflictions and diseases and all these things, cancer, that have been afflicting us. And, and it really made me, and he's, he went into talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and into, into the fiery furnace. But before I get there, it, it reminds me that of, of the verse in Matthew 4.1, and it's through, it goes through 11, but I'm not going to read it all. And it said, and I did a teaching on, I need to slow down. I know I got lots here and I'm trying to speed it up so I don't keep you here too long. But I did a, I remember doing a teaching several years back and I titled it Off Road. And it was out of this verse and out of one of my soaps that I, that the Lord revealed this to me. And in Matthew 4, 1 starts out this way. It says, Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness there to be tempted 40 days by the devil. And for them, he fasted on. And the first thing the devil did is he came in and tested Jesus's identity. If you are the son of man. And, and he did the same thing with Adam. And we've covered all this in the past. And it made me think back, well, what kind of father, when his, his child first goes into ministry, sends his child out to be tempted by the devil? One who says, my son's not going to fail. My child's not going to fail. The Lord does not send us out in these circumstances in life. He does, not, he does not allow us to be sick. He does not allow us to hurt. Not knowing that when we go through the fires, when we go into the pits, he's not there to push us in and to keep us down. He's not there to see us fail. He says, I want you to see what my son can do. I want you to see what my daughter can do. I explained it this way back then. Imagine that since we're in the Northwest, I used a four, four-wheel drive Jeep. And I said, when I go out and I want to purchase a Jeep, the last thing I want to do is take it on a nice, smooth city road. I want to go hit every hole. I want to take it up the hill. I want to take it over something like a log in the middle of it, a deep mud hole. That's the way the Lord, I think, takes the wheel when he takes my life. Let's see what he can do. Let's get this thing off road. Let's hit every pothole. Let's find something deeper. But he, he waits until those times in our life where we're ready for it. He doesn't set us up to fail. We often pray, Lord, get this fire out of my life. Lord, get me out of this pit. Well, son, you need to stay there just a little bit longer to see what I can do. Until, until you're down enough to look up and see what I can do. So often I try to do it all on my own. And then I say, okay, God, now I'm ready for you to step in because I can't do it anymore. And Mickey talked about these are the foundations we need before we're dealing with affliction and disease, before we're dealing with heartaches and hurts and pains. We need to have the foundation that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my wife said I pronounced it three times wrong last week, But in those circumstances, if we don't have the firm foundation that Chuck was talking about, I talked about it two weeks ago, our foundations can be shaken. Sometimes we fall off, and God says, sometimes I allow you to fall off, but I pick you up and I put you back on it. We, we have to get to a place where we know that foundation is and what it is and who it is and why it's there, and that's why we read our Bibles. So that our problems don't make God look small. Because God doesn't see it that way. I encouraged you last time that God is for us. And I read Romans 8, 29, 31. And I'm going to read it again because it is encouragement and it is hope. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. So that his son could be the first born among many brothers and sisters. And that having chosen them, he called them. To come to him, and having called them, he gave them right standing with him, and he has given them right. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. We are given right standing. We are given his glory. We are his brothers and sisters. He walks with us, and I said last time, he walks before us, beside us, in back of us. He has surrounded us. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? And a lot of times, life doesn't feel that way. It feels like everyone's against us. It feels like the enemy's against us, people against us, circumstances against us. At some points in my life, it feels like God is against me because he's allowed me to fall off that. 
because I took that step. <laughs> He's not up there pushing. Which brings me back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because as they took steps towards the fire, as they were given a chance to get, get out of the flames, a second opportunity. We read from Daniel 3.16, and I'm not going to read 8 through 18. I'm not going to read all of it. But they basically, to sum it up, it says, If we are thrown in the furnace, the God whom we are able to serve, he will rescue us. And even if he doesn't, we will not bow. I want that kind of attitude. I want to be able to see my God for who he is, that he will see me through it. And if he doesn't see me through it, I'm going to see him anyway. I'm going to see him in the fire. I'm going to see him when I come out the other side. And to get there, I took a look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and, and, and how they were prepared for it. They had been prepared for God their whole life. They have had communication with him their whole life. They had the firm foundation that they needed. And I'm going to walk us through uh, Daniel 1 through, uh, I'm going to try to get through Daniel's chapter 1 and 3. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to go through them. Otherwise, we'd be here till tomorrow. But they were given that firm foundation. They were close with that man in the fire who came to the rescue. And I love, and, and, and this, this whole two-week, this two-part session really came out of Mickey's one sentence, which says, they came out and they didn't even smell like smoke. And, and last two weeks ago, I, I, I tried to communicate, how do we walk through fires? How do we walk through trials? How do we walk through all the hard, hard parts of our life not coming out smelling like smoke? Because I said, whenever you're even in the vicinity of smoke, you smell like it. It gets into everything. It's hard to even wash out. I'm not going to go through, through the things that I, I discussed in my life f about five years ago when Jill and I were walking through the fire. I don't need to do that. Because the, in that part of my life is when I was closest with God. I remember when I was laid off from work in that, in that two years. I remember at that time, I had nothing else. I'd hit rock bottom. And it was in that time the first time in my life that I pressed into God and I searched out Jesus and I sought his face rather than saying, woe is me, poor me. I said, Jesus, you got this because I don't. And it was in those times that I reached for my Bible and I spent hours studying, hours praying, some hours crying because I didn't know what to do. And it's in, in those times that God shows up. Not in those times where, where I'll say in the, in the last three months that I've told you we went through some things too. In those times, it took a little, little more for God to get a hold of me. Hey, you, take a little shaking because I've grown accustomed to, I got this, Lord, you're on my side, let's do this. No, no, son, Let, let's make sure this is where we're going. Let's make sure this is what we're doing. Yeah, we got this, Lord, right? No. Sometimes not. Sometimes it takes a, a little bit of fire, a little bit of flame, a little bit of heat. Sometimes it take a pit, takes a pit in our lives that we are thrown into for us to realize, oh, I might have stepped off that foundation and I thought God was following me. <laughs> it's in those circumstances that we look up and we, we ask, oh, okay, I've, I've fallen off somewhere here. Where's the path that I need to be on? It's those parts of my life. That, 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 that create that little smoky smell. And if we take a look back at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God didn't put out their fire. When they were bound outside of the fire, they still went in. They had issues on the outside that went in on the inside. And it's when the fire was hottest that the Lord revealed himself to them. It's when, when the trouble was the most significant, when they needed to see Jesus the most, that's when they saw him. That's when they become unbound. That's when they became walking around in the fire. And sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, sometimes deliverance only comes in the flame. And if I can reach that point of my life saying, Lord, is this one of those flame moments that I need to understand? It's no, not one of those times that I'm thinking, okay, oh, if, what, what am I walking in? Sin and, and temptation. Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. No. 
Sometimes we do that. Sometimes I do that. But it's in those times that I need to reach out and I need to seek God. It's in those times that I need to desperately see his face rather than what I've done in my past, which is often segregating myself from him because I'm ashamed at who the devil has told me I am and who he's told me I'm not. Lord, let me be love. Let me be patient. Let me be kind. No, I don't let you. You are. And I finished up last two weeks ago with that there will always be fires. There will always be trials that we're going to walk through. But I asked you to have faith. I asked you to stay on that strong foundation. I asked you to come out of the fire. And I finished with trying to smell it, not like smoke. So I'm going to move on this week. And this is part two of Smoke Free. And... We got through it in about 15 minutes, sorry. But most times in our American culture, we think that prevention is better than a cure. We think that if we live our lives in accordance, so I'll, I'll start out with physically, we think if we get the proper amount of exercise, the proper amount of vitamins, the proper amount of minerals, the drink the eight ounces of water, you know. If you're in my family, you bathe in oils. What, no laughing? You, you live a life of drug-free, alcohol-free. You, you obey all your traffic laws. You wear your seatbelt. And we prepare to be safe and coddled. Lord, if we do life right, won't everything be okay? And, and most of the times, despite our efforts, life's not candy-coated like that. Things still go wrong. People still have heart attacks. People still have cancer. People still die. Our children rebel, jobs get lost, homes got lost, finances are in ruins. And, and these, these are people that follow God. These are people that I, I possibly know, people that I would consider righteous in my life. But it still falls on them. Which comes to our story of Meshach, Radchak, and Abednego. I did that on purpose. Just see if she was paying attention. But it's a story we've heard as small children. We've heard in Sunday school classes growing up, vacation Bible school. I bet if we go into the classroom, on the other side of that wall, there's probably a Veggie Tail video. Lay, lay, this, this is the title of it, Rack Shack and Benny. And it's about not giving in to peer pressure. I know because I watched it. <clears throat> But the stories like these that we, we take for granted when we read the Bible, we skip through them just like we read the, read the fairy tales and the novels of, Ameri of the American culture, and we don't really relate to them because in our world they seem so far-fetched and untangible because God hasn't, does, hasn't seemed to move that way in so long. When's the last time I was thrown in a fiery furnace and Jesus showed up in, in, in amongst with me and we walked out smelling like roses instead of smoke? It's, it's something that my mind can't wrap around most of the time. But there's so much in here that we can relate to our lives. That when we read the Bible and we apply it to our lives, that it comes alive and jumps off the page. And, and, and I'm, I'm reminded often of Jesus in the New Testament, the entire time he's speaking. It's all parables, all riddles, all things for us to find out, all puzzles for us to search out. It is his pleasure for us to dig in the word and to apply it to our lives and relate it. It is his pleasure. So I want to talk about these, these three Hebrew men that went into the fire, since I can't say their names right. But they lived righteous lives. And even though they lived righteous lives, they encountered a lot of evil, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. I'm going to go through the story of not just the three of them, but their friend Daniel as well as I start in chapter one, and I'm not quite there yet. But as they encountered all these things that they were facing, they stood on their foundation, and even though they were righteous, even though they stood what God wanted them to do, things got hotter and things got harder. 
I want to encourage you that even though life gets harder and even though situations get hotter, the Lord is still there. It doesn't mean you've strayed off the path. Look at these examples these men were in. They, they, they stood firm on who they are and who God called them to be, which I'm going to show you. Yet life still got harder. Their, their situations got more challenging. And the Lord does that with us. As we, as we start out as baby Christians and we don't know what to do, we glean just a little bit, we learn just a little bit, we grow just a little bit. But as we get stronger, as we get a firmer foundation, as we stand on the truth and God reveals himself to us, it takes us... He takes us to a new level with more difficult challenges to say, look what he can do. Look, world. Look what my son can do. Look what my daughter can do. Because it is my hope and dream that when I get to meet my father, that he says, I'm proud of you, son. Look what you did. I don't want to stand there weeping in front of my father ashamed, knowing of all the things that I've done. Because the enemy tries to convince us right up until that point, that's who you are. Life is not going to be easy. Oftentimes we're dealt rotten, rotten hands. Rotten circumstances. But it's in these stories like the fiery furnace that we find hope. It's in God's word that we find hope, that he releases hope in the truth of who he is. It's in those times that we need to desperately see a miracle as we're standing in the flames of life. Romans 15, 4 says this, such things were written in the scripture, such things as this, what I'm reading about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, any story in there, these things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, to teach us now. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement and at, this is the tricky part. As we wait patiently for the Lord's promises to be fulfilled, that is the most difficult for me and I think most people. The Lord has declared truth and life over my life. He has given me promise upon promise. And Lord, I stand here waiting. Just like Chuck said, Lord, we got like three more days. When are you showing up? You said, the Lord said it, he's going to do it. The word is very clear on that. It's my job to make sure I heard it right. So I'm going to go ahead and get into Daniel chapter 1. And I'm not going to read it, so no need to put it up. I'm just going to go through it because I'm going to try to get through chapters 1 through 3 all the way to the fiery furnace because I want to take a look back at where Daniel and his three friends came from, what they went through, and how they managed to live a wholesome, righteous life in the middle of a world that was out to destroy them. How they, in fact, came out smelling like roses instead of smelling like smoke. And it started in Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar, and he took his massive army, and this time Babylon was the biggest, the meanest. It was the most wealthiest. They had the largest army. Everybody was scared of Babylon. If you read your Bible, they were not nice to their captives. And if you, if, if you look further into the word in Revelations, they even relate Babylon to the new modern day world. And it, and it meant Babylon then, Babylon a little further then, or Babylon a little further. And even though we know Babylon was destroyed, Babylon can still be recognized as our today's modern world. So when I talk about Babylon, think, think worldly. And so this, these are the people that are coming against Judah. The world is coming against God's people. And Judah, Scott has told us, means praise and worship. So the world is coming against God's people and coming against their praise and their worship of God. And it's in this time that the word says in Daniel that the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar victory over Judah. And reading this, I went, Lord, how is that possible? How can you give the world victory over praise and worship? And it's in that, mo that moment that he took me to, to Jeremiah because he told them it was coming. If you do not turn away from your false gods, if you do not proclaim my name, this is what's going to happen. You are going to be captives in Babylon for at least 70 years. You need to turn back to me and we will... And, and it won't happen. 
but, but, but the people couldn't do it. The praise and worship was already gone. Judah at this point was just a name. And the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon victory over Judah. And it's in this time that they enslaved. They didn't enslave everyone. But they took, they took all the most popular, the most beautiful, the, the richest, the wealthiest. They took all kinds of these people, which I'm going to get into. But part of, part of, jumped ahead of myself. As I was asking God how, how he could allow Judah to be taken, and after he revealed to me that, no, oh, I warned them, I promised them, I have to be who I am and follow through with my word, he reminded me that, out of Ephesians 2.2, 2, he reminded me there is a constant enemy here in the world. There, in Babylon, where we're at, in the world, all this worldly things, we will always have an enemy. We will always be under attack as God's chosen people. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, it says that the enemy is the prince and power of the air. In John 12.31, it describes him as the ruler of this world, of the Babylon that we live in. And it's not that he rules over our lives because we as Christians have already won, won the war. We've won the battle. We know the enemy's defeated, but the attacks never stop. In our civilization, in the United States, throughout the world, he is a major influence. He has, he has changed the ideals of the world. Our opinions, our goals, our hopes, our views. And I say our as the United States in general because this is where I live, but you can see it worldwide. His influence has reached almost all corners of the world. It's changed our philosophy, our culture, it's in our education, it's in our commerce, it's in our media, our social media. Turn on the news, go to Facebook, holy moly. You'll see Christians on there spewing stuff out going, I'm glad I'm not on social media because it really, the enemy is in everything. He gets into our thoughts. He creeps into who he wants us to be. He, he messes with our identity in every circumstance, every opportunity that he can. And it's so easily because so easy because my mind is so feeble when I'm when I'm living in the world and I'm not in the world. I'm not I'm not facing God and with Jesus every day. Because the less I'm with Jesus, the more I'm in the world. And it's in, when I'm more in the world that the enemy creeps into every aspect of my life and says, oh, you're not really, you're not really doing a good job over there. I'm, uh, I got this. Don't worry about that. And the enemy creeps into little tiny parts of our life. And I'll tell you right now, one of the reasons I don't get on social media is because I don't like who I am. I become judgmental, opinionated. And then you go, hmm. Power. How I got on that, I don't know. Back, back to Daniel, back to Daniel. Chapter one. So it's at this time that Nebuchadnezzar and his army took all the sacred objects out of the temple. And when he took the sacred objects, he took them back to Babylon and he put them back in his God's temple. And I say God's because they had many of them in Babylon. And one of the things that I think this represented is when Nebuchadnezzar took all of the sacraments of the temple is he cut off their form of worship. There was no way to get back to God. There was no way for forgiveness because the temple is where they went to be forgiven, to have a relationship with God, to have worship. Nebuchadnezzar takes this and he takes it into Babylon and says, now this is the only place you can have it. And it's only in this temple that you can reach it. So he as he brings the sacraments to Babylon, he also takes the royal families, the noble people, the smartest, the richest, the healthiest. He takes the most beautiful. He leaves the rest of them behind. The destruction of Judah and Israel hasn't come yet. But he's taken what he wants. And it's later that he destroys that and takes the rest of them, leaves the weakest, the poorest, the, the, the sickly, the, the uneducated. Let's see what they can do now. And the first thing he does when he takes them back to Babylon is he picks out a handful of them. 
the best looking, the most poised, the most elegant sounding, the, the most educated. Um, at, at this time, they would take a lot of the younger ones because they're easier to teach. They're easier to manipulate. And he ordered them to be trained. And he ordered them to be trained to learn the new language, the, the language of the Babylonians. He, he told them that they were going to learn their literature, their history. He, was go- he also said that he would provide the best food and the best drink from his, his kitchen. And it, it's, it's not always easy to see. But with Babylon, two things happen when we get in the world. The chains of bondage reach us quicker and easier when we're in the world and not with God and seeking Him. And with that, the temptations that come along with the world kind of seep their way into our lives because it's while we're in bondage that, that we don't notice all the things going on around us. It's, it's at those points that, that the enemy tries to take our language he tries to take our voice and who we are and who God's proclaimed us to be. It's when he, he, he tries to change our literature and what we're reading. He takes us away from the word of God and puts us maybe watching the news or watching movies or, or, or reading magazines or books. And, and I'm not saying all of that's bad. But it takes us away from what we're supposed to be doing when we're in bondage. He tries to change our history And our history is who we are. I'm not talking about what you've done, but I'm talking about where we've came from. Our history is part of our identity. I came from my father who came from his father. It's part of my history. And it's part of our identity. And it's something that's attached to us forever. And Nebuchadnezzar, this is one of the things he's trying to take from Daniel and his friends. And then he tempts them with food and wine and tries to convince us, the enemy tries to convince us that we can live by bread alone, the bread of this world. And the Bible is very clear that we cannot be sustained by the bread of this world and what it offers us, but that we live on every word that comes out of the Lord's mouth, out of the Father's mouth. So after they get to Babylon, the king decides, King Nebuchadnezzar sa- says, we're going to train these people for three years. And only some of them, some of them, the, the best and the brightest, will we, will we choose. But we're going to train them and pick, pick from this group of people which ones we want to serve on my court and in my kingdom. And four that were chosen out of, out of the group of people were, were Daniel and I'll, and I'll use their, their Jewish names, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. And you have to understand that at this point, when, when Nebuchadnezzar had picked them, when he had taken them away from their families, their homes, out of their country, put them in chains, when he had given them, the, when he had tried to change everything about them, their customs, their food, everything, their religion, the, the, the word says that these, these young men That's how it describes them in my Bible. But if you really take a look back at it, they may have been young men in their day and time. But if we take a a look back at it now, these were children. They're 11 to 12 years old, my daughter's age. And one one of the things that they do in Babylon to slaves in this time, people that were going to serve on the king's court under him, the first thing they did to the young men is make them eunuchs. It would take their mind off of anything they weren't supposed to. It would put them in line doing what they were told to do. And the next thing they did with these young men, these boys, is try to change their identity. They gave them new names. Daniel was Belshazzar. Hananiah became Shadrach. Shadrach. (laughs) Michelle became Meshach and Azariah become, well, there's several ways to say it, but the way we, I was taught to say it as a children was Abednego, even though it's probably not proper. And I asked myself why the name changed, and it always comes back to identity. When the Lord speaks with me, he always says, because the enemy is trying to always attack who you are and who I've created you to be. 
And if you take a look back at their Hebrew names, it's exactly who God created them to be. And it's one of the things that I love when I'm reading through Daniel 1 and 3, that only one place in, in, in the entire reading are they referred to by their Babylonian names. The rest of the time, they are called by their real names because that's who God created them to be. Daniel, God is my judge. Hananiah, Yahweh has been gracious. Michelle, who is what God is? Basically, you were created after God. Azariah, Yahweh has helped. All of their names were centered around God. And their new names, Daniel, Belshazzar, Bel will protect their false idol, their false god. Shadrach, inspired by Aku, one of their other gods. Meshach, belonging to Aku. Abednego, servant of Nego. All false gods, all trying to change who they are in their narrative for their life, all an attack on their identity. New names, giving, giving slaves new names was also a custom back in the Babylonian days. It was normal. It's what they did because when you can change a person's identity, if I call an individual stupid long enough, eventually they're going to believe it, especially at 12 years old. If I tell somebody how weak they are when they're this age, they're, they will believe who they are. At this age, it's just when, when they were given these new names and because they were educated, because they were versed in the language, because they were versed in the history, because they were versed in their gods and their, the, the identities of their gods, they knew what these mean, names meant. The hope was that Nebuchadnezzar could call them this and they would believe it because eventually if you believe it, it changes who you are and it changes your nature and it changes your life. And pretty soon your life starts matching the title you were given. This is the power of a name. It's one of those things that made me look back when I became a believer. And I wasn't just given the name of believer, but I took on the name of a Christian. And Christian, the, the, the word Christian has almost become a bad word in the Babylonian era that we live in. Because nobody wants to see a follower of Christ in this day because it makes them feel bad and it makes them feel guilty. And all of a sudden we're self-righteous, those Christians. No, no. If I'm following and imitating Christ, they're going to see his love. There's been few, few years in the past that Christians have, have grown into a bad names. We've done bad things. I, I will admit it, but that's not who we are. That's not the title we've been given. And I look in a mirror and, and I look back at the first Corinthians. Is this who I am? Am I a follower of Christ? Does my life reflect that I'm a follower of Christ? If somebody sees me out on the street and what am I doing and what I seeing, does that reflect who Christ is? And if it's not, maybe I need to get back in the mirror a little bit and, re and, and, and remind myself who I am how the Lord sees me. I am love. I am patient. I am kind. I am all these things the Lord proclaimed me to be. And we each are all of those things. We have to believe it. Through every circumstance, everything that we go through. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, we are imitators of God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. I want to be in a place that like Daniel and like his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they made up their minds at a young age, whether it be physically a young age, whether it be spiritually a young Christian, I need to make up my mind and I need to know that I have that foundation and, 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 and that I don't want to disappoint my father, that I don't want to just slide into heaven by the skin of my teeth, but I want amazing son, you did awesome. You hit a home run. I want to be like Daniel and his three friends who say, no, I will not defile myself. With, with, the, with the spoils that this world keeps offering us. I don't want to be tempted by the wine and, and, and the food that came from the chef's kitchen of the king, the, the earthly kings. And, and I'll use this as an example because 
it, the Lord reminded me as it, when I got to this place, and we, we were talking about Alaska earlier this morning, so it seems fitting. I remember in those five years ago when I seemed like I was sitting in the fire, but I was at peace because I was with Jesus. Uh, it was in those times that, that I was served up this golden platter of everything I wanted, and I believed it to be the Lord. Even though I wasn't, wasn't in a place in life and I was stressed out and all these things were going on, I got this golden platter right in the middle of all this chaos and craziness. And my friend from Alaska who's probably listening, love you guys, hope to see you soon. Uh, he calls me up and says, hey, I've got this gig. Uh, I know you can do carpentry and all this stuff. I got this house that's kind of halfway done and I just bought a new house and my renters are moving out and I want to sell it. Uh, I'll pay you for the next six months to a year to come up and remodel my house. Sounds pretty good, especially what he said he'd pay me. He says, not only that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little bit more on the platter. Here's, here's, here's some, some yummies over here. I also, my wife opened up a new business, so your wife, I'll, we'll give her a job over here too. And I'll pay your son a little bit to come up, help you with the house because you're not going to be able to do it all by yourself. It's got a one-bedroom apartment above it that's completely done. I've stayed there many times. It's nice. Not only that, he goes, but your daughter, well, I've got two young ones, and while I'm away at work and my wife's away at work, well, we'll pay her to be the nanny. Oh, by the way, we got an extra car. We'll just leave at the airport for you when you get here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I've been trying to get my wife to Alaska since we've been married. And she looks at me and she goes, I guess we're going to Alaska. And I remember going to sleep that night with a smile on my face. And I remember being woke up in the middle of the night and God says, no. What? I'm pretty sure this was you. No. Unbelievable. I remember calling up my friend the next day and I thank God that he's a Christian and a believer because if I would have said this to anybody that wasn't, they'd have thought I was absolutely mad said, I can't come. He goes, why not? I said, the Lord said, no. I guess you're staying then. Yes, yes I am. And I don't know what he's doing or where I'm going, but I think I might cry. <laughs> but like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, when they were going through the flames, when they were offered up this platter of good food and they didn't receive it, because it's not the best of what God had for them. Like Scott says, it might have hit the bullseye. God might have put his finger of favor on what they were doing. He might have put his finger of favor on me when I w took my family to Alaska, but it wasn't hitting the bullseye for my life. It wasn't, what, it wasn't the best that he had for me. It wasn't the feast that he's prepared already. And just like, just like these friends... They saw favor in everything they did because they sought out God's direction and God's guidance. They were constantly in prayer and they had that foundation and they knew who that fourth man was going to be. So God gave them favor in every aspect, in learning and literature, science. They gave Daniel the, the ability to interpret dreams and visions. And so after these young men spent three years in training and, and, and being told they're completely different people, you're going to be this and you're going to be that, they stood firm on their identity and who they were. They stood firm on the name that the Lord had given them and not what the world has said they are and needs to become. They said, no, we will not give in to the temptations of, of, the, of the spoils that the world's giving me, these yummy bites, because I'm telling you what, the chef of the king at that time probably had every delicacy, every weird thing they've never seen, things they've probably only dreamed of and heard of. And they said, no, this is what the Lord has for us. And after this three years, the king Nebuchadnezzar, he calls in all of these young men that he, because it wasn't just these four. These are the ones that the Lord has put his f finger of favor, his hand of favor on. This is the ones we read about in the Bible. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But there was many. It wasn't just the four. And he calls in all of these, and I assume it's one by one because he talks to each and every one of them. And he claims that the, that the brightest and the smartest and the ones that stood out the most were Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I love even this, at this point in his life, even when the king was most impressed, he didn't call them by their, by their new, new Babylonian names. 
he was most impressed for who they were, Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, because they gleamed the glory of God, and the king knew there was something special about them. Beloved, I'm telling you, whether you, the, whether you know it or not, God's glory is in us, and it's shining out of us, and we're given opportunities every day to let people see it, just like these four. Oh dear, I'm only in chapter two. So he appointed them advisors. I'm going to go fast now. He appointed them as advisors, and he, he, he said they were better judges, and they were more knowledgeable. They were smarter. They were quicker learners than any of the sorcerers and magicians and astrologers that had previously been Nebuchadnezzar's council for his entire reign. And so he puts them in, in, in charge of all of these people who become jealous and angry. And then King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and he's not sure about it. He's so disturbed about it. And we've been, all been there with these dreams. We're giving these, we're some, no, I'm going to do too fast. Breathe. We've all been in those places in our lives where we're woken up in the middle of the night and we've been given these dreams and we wake up and we can only remember half of it, but we're like, what was that? And sometimes they're kind of terrifying. Sometimes we don't know what's going on. Sometimes they keep us awake because, oh, I fell back asleep and it left me right back where I was and I didn't want to be there in the first place. So now I'm sitting there trying not to fall back asleep. This is the point where Nebuchadnezzar was. What am I dreaming? What is this about? Why am I losing sleep? And he doesn't call for, for the new guys he's put in charge. He doesn't call for the slaves. He's called for his advisors that have, have been in charge of being his advisors for his entire reign. And they come in and, and he says, I demand that you tell me what my dream was and, and what the meaning of it means. And, and being any, any person, but especially these people, they say, we can't possibly tell you what the dream was. Nobody can do that. No human on the planet can do it. Go ahead and tell us what, what the dream was, and we'll tell you what it means. And he says, ah, I see through your trickery. Tell me what the dream was, or I'm going to take you out, tie you to horses, tear you from limb to limb. And they said, no man alive can do this, your majesty. It's impossible, and I wake up every day thinking, thanking God that he is the king of the impossible because it's at this point that the king is furious. I love how my Bible puts it. His face became contorted. That's how angry he was, and he warns him a second time, tell me what my dream was, or I'm going to have you killed. Lord, we, uh, king, we can't do this. Fine. Since you can't do this and you represent all my wise counsel, I'm killing all of the wise men in, in Babylon. And this is the point where they come to Daniel's in his friend's room. And at this point, you have to realize it's only been three years. So now these, this is 14 and 15-year-old young men with some burly big dude holding a sword from the army saying, sorry, guys, you're done. Off with your head. And it's at this time that the maturity of a 15-year-old kid who's been with God, who's been hanging out with Jesus, who's been in prayer, who's been in the Word, who has a strong foundation, says, well, why was that order given? He says, I'd like to talk to the king. And he goes and he talks to Nebuchadnezzar and says, just give me a little more time. Let us see if we can figure out what this dream was and what, what it means. And the next thing he did, which is important, he went back to his friends and said, we need to do this together. Beloved, when we come together, God can do marvelous things. Oftentimes we get in these circumstances in our life and we face the fiery furnace and we think that we're going through it alone. The last thing we want to do is we want to tell somebody else I'm having problems. I guarantee you there are other people in this crowd that are having the same problems I'm having and having the same problems you're having coming together in a group of people that are having the same problem, praying against it, interceding for one another. You want to see Jesus show up in the flames of your life? That's the perfect time. When we're desperate for him, seeking him, in this circumstance, they're praying for their lives. And, and miraculously, Daniel has the ability to interpret dreams and visions. And that night he goes to sleep. How he slept, I don't know. But the Lord reveals his dream. And they wake up in the morning. He tells his friends. And they, they wake up early and they praise God together. I can't help but think that this circumstance in their life wasn't just the first fire that they were facing. They were being tested and tried just like Joseph in the pit that Scott was talking about. 
They're going to have opportunities to be tested and tested and tested again, just like Joseph, who moved from the pit to Potiphar's house to the jail. We're going to have those circumstances in our life where we have a problem here and it gets bigger here and it gets probably bigger there because the Lord is maturing and growing us in every circumstance of our life. If you're facing the same problem over and over and over again, I think, Lord, either I'm really stupid or I haven't grown. And, and we want to be like David, facing the lion, facing the bear, before we have to face the giant. We want God to train us up and teach us. We need to, to face a little bit of a spark before we face a flame. So after that, Daniel gets to, wake, he wakes up, they, they worship, they praise the God, and he goes to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, okay, uh, the Lord's given me, giving me clarity on what you dreamed I'll tell you as long as you you don't kill all these people and my friends and you know all the, and he says but let me tell you this no one but God in heaven can reveal these secrets he takes no credit which I'm guessing the sorcerers the astrologers they'd have been oh look what we did look what we did you know and and, and so we get into the dream and we're still in Daniel 2 and the dream the dream Daniel tells him is about the future He says, this is what's going to happen. The Lord wants you to understand. He wants you to know that this is what your dream is. And it's a picture of the future and what's going to happen. And he tells him about the big statue. If you remember the dream, he says, there was a big statue. It was huge. It was powerful. It was shiny. He says, it was scary. And the head was of gold. The chest and arms were of silver. The belly and thighs of bronze. The legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. He says, and then in your dream you saw a rock, and it was a supernatural rock that came from a mountain and was dropped at the foot of the statue, and it hit the feet of the statue, and it crumbled it into little pieces. And these little pieces were so little they were like chaff, and they were blown away in the wind, and there were no more. And the rock stayed, and it became a great mountain. And he says, now let me tell you the meaning of the dream. God, God made you, Nebuchadnezzar, ruler of this world. He made you the head. He made you the most powerful. You are the head of gold. But after that, after your dynasty ends, another dynasty will come to rule the world. They will not be as powerful as you were. So they will be of silver. And he goes through all of these until he gets to the feet with the fifth dynasty. And he says that one will be of clay and iron. And naturally, clay and iron don't mix together. And it's the same picture in this dream. He says, in this dynasty, it is when the, the rock will hit the feet and the feet will shatter into little pieces. It's when the dynasty of the Babylonians will end. It will be no more. And the rock represents God's kingdom that will last forever. So he is giving him generation upon generation of Babylonian, the world ruling the world. And then he shows us a picture of Jesus Christ coming into it in an everlasting kingdom. So it's at this point that Nebuchadnezzar, is, he's excited. He learns what the dream is all about. He bows down and he worships Daniel. He gives him this huge elevated position. He puts him as, as the head, head guy over, over his kingdom. And, and Daniel puts Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as his aides because he can't do it by himself. And we reach chapter 3. And at the beginning of chapter 3, I don't know how much space comes between, between the end of that and this new one. But the first thing Nebuchadnezzar does is build a 90-foot tall statue of himself made out of gold. I can't help but think this came from the dream. I can't help but think it was a, a, a little, little inkling of jealousy. Oh, yeah? I want to be, instead of the head just being gold, my whole dynasty is going to be gold. My whole kingdom is going to be strong. My whole dynasty is going to live forever. This God you speak of. And he quickly forgot how powerful God was. Quickly forgot who God was. And, and as, as his, the statue was made and that was put up, he, 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 he sent out for all of his leaders and, and they got together and these were not the Jewish leaders again. These were all the leaders that he has depended on for most of his life. And they decide they're going to get together, dedicate this statue, and they make a decision because they don't like any of the Jews being in power. They don't like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
they're jealous of them in their new positions. So they make up these rules and tell the king that this is what needs to be done. You need to make a decree that these people need to bow down and worship you and your statue alone. Whenever the music plays and the astrologers became jealous and they went to the king tattling and whining. King Nebuchadnezzar, you, you made this rule and these jewels, Jews aren't following it. The music is played and they won't bow down. They won't worship you. And King Nebuchadnezzar is furious. Once again, all contorted. And he calls them in and asks them, is this true? And he even gives them a second chance. If you say you will bow, I will spare your lives. And they still refused. And Nebuchadnezzar's words were, what kind of God can rescue from my power? And the king was furious. And he, made, he stoked the flame seven times hotter. And this is where we were last, last time I was up here. And he, made, he, gave the, he gave orders to the strongest men in his army, the biggest men in his army. We'll think of, he called the Navy SEALs to come in and bind them, tie them up, and drag them off to the furnace. And before they got to the furnace, the flames lapped out, devoured the soldiers. And the word says that the three fell in the fire. And as they were in the fire, it says that their, their chains came off, their bindings came off. There was a fourth man that appeared. Nebuchadnezzar was beside himself, completely blew his mind. Didn't we send in three? Why is there four? Why does he look like, like an angel of God? Why are they walking around unbound? Why are they unhurt? And, and I'm sure out of not just fear for his own life, he didn't want to get too close to the flames. He didn't want to get lapped up. He said, hey, you guys, come out. What's going on in there? And the word says that not a hair on their head was singed. The clothes weren't scorched. And they didn't even smell like smoke. And you ask yourself, how can this be? How can you come out of life, circumstances, the pain, smelling smoke free? I got five reasons I'll bless you real quick. And, they all, and, and I made them all start with the letter P so it can confuse everybody. The first one is they were persuaded. The three of them were so persuaded in their life. If you take a look back at Abraham, he never wavered in what he believed in God's promise. His faith grew stronger. He brought glory to God, and he was fully convicted of who God was. Another word for convicted is persuaded. Romans 4, 20 through 21, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, he, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought God, glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do whatever he promised, and because of Abraham's faith, God counted, him, God counted him righteous. And when God counted him righteous, it was, wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God would also count us as righteous if we believed in him and the one who raised Jesus, our Lord and Savior, from the dead. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this one thing was very apparent to me when I was reading this, this, their story, is they were fully convinced, they were fully persuaded in who God was in their lives. Nothing could convince them anyways. otherwise. No threats, no consequences, no punishment. Nothing could make them bow. Lord, I want to be a place in my life that there's nothing in this world can make me bow but other than to the will of God. And sometimes it feels like life has pushed us too far, but it's in these times that I need to be persuaded and convinced or convinced so much as these three that I need to push back because the world cannot take me by force because I've already won the battle because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We've already won. God can rescue us from cancer, sickness, addiction. He can cause fa favor to fall on our lives. He can restore finances. He can restore health. He can restore relationships. But if he hasn't yet, and you're in one of these places, do not waver in your faith and your foundation of who God is. Don't waver on what he can do. Make a decision. I will not bow down. Number two, pressure. After, after one would assume we have been so persuaded with our attitude and we're in this place, we, we, we are convinced and persuaded that with this attitude coming to God, there's going to be break, breakthrough in my life. But like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that wasn't necessarily true. The three of these defied the world. And the king didn't back down. The king of the world did not back down. The enemy will not back down. 
In fact, he turned up the pressure. He turned up the gas. He made the flames hotter. Sometimes in our life, when we are faced with things and when we are on the right path, flames will get higher, hotter. Things will get harder. And like these three, things may get worse. And when we're staring down at the fire and we're asking God to save us, we're asking God to take away the flames. We need to understand that sometimes he allows them to remain. And we cannot reach a place in our lives of despair. Because when the world turns up pressure and the flames get hotter, these are the times that God shows up. Because he says, look what my son, look what my daughter can do. God is going to be God, and God is good, and he is faithful, and he is on our side. Number three, promise. I'm going to read out of Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. But, but now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created, O Israel, the one, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid. I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, beloved, when we are in deep waters, when we feel like we're treading water, when we feel like our head is going underwater, it is in these times that he says, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, when the water is so turbulent and life is so bumpy and and you feel like you're swimming against the current and you're still going the wrong way, he says, I will not let you drown. The next sentence says, when you walk through the fires of oppression, you will not be burned up and the flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God. I am your Savior. God doesn't always save us from the deep water and the turbulent water and and, and the flames. Sometimes he says, tread it a little longer. Sometimes he says, swim a little harder. Sometimes he has to jump in the flame and walk with us. But no matter what we're going through, what situation, we need to understand that we're not going to be burned up. We're not going to be consumed. And at some point, we will be delivered, whether the problem goes away or whether it doesn't, whether it's in this life or whether it's in death. And in some times, beloved, these are the hard times in our life. Fire is deadly. One of the things that that I remember touching me and impacting me one of the most is, is our beloved sister, Diane Olson. And I remember one of her last things that she asked of the body was for us to come and worship with her because she missed dancing and she missed worshiping. And I remember sitting there watching her dance with her hands and she worshiped and prayed. It's like, oh my gosh, even in, even in sickness, even in death, that's how good God is. There was such peace and such love of who God is she knew. And it opened my eyes so clearly that, that, that even if I get burned in a fire, I still get to see Jesus and I still get to be with him. I will not be destroyed and I will not be conquered by this world or the enemy. We want to expect miracles outside of the flames, but sometimes the flames is all we get. Number four, his presence. When King Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the fire, Jesus walked with them. Their chains were broken, they were unharmed, and they did not smell like smoke. Satan puts us, Satan Satan tries to manipulate us in in these circumstances of fires and pits and deep waters and rough places. He keeps us emotionally, emotional and living small, small, uh, unconventional lives. He keeps us contained. He he, He wants us to think that we don't matter and our identity is in the world, not in God. He wants us to live in doubt and fear. He wants us to think we're going down in flames. And beloved, like Chuck says, no more. No more can we stand for this. Our God in heaven has provided us a savior that when we're going through these circumstances, he can and he will break our chains. Back to Isaiah 43. Whatever trouble we're facing, whatever trial, Jesus reveals himself in it. Sometimes it takes us going through that trial to realize that Jesus was even in it. Sometimes he doesn't, we can't see it because we're so focused on what we're going through that we don't even look up to realize that he's there. And it's only afterwards that we realize he walked through it with us the entire time. Because there's no way I could have done it by myself. It's in those times that we need to dig deeper in the word. We need to seek Jesus' face harder than we've ever sought. I would be the word. <laughs> Seek it. 
It's in those times that we need to move forward in life instead of moving away from him and having doubt and fear and letting the enemy creep in. We are not alone. If you, if you look back in the day of these, these three that went into the flames, we see four people that, that, were, that, that were in amongst the fire walking around, four. Yet only three came out. So I ask you this question today, where'd the fourth one go? Is it possible that he's still walking around in the flames of our life knowing that we're going to be in there to help us get out of them? He's still ready to walk with us. Number five, promotion. When they exited the fire, when they came out, the first thing Nebuchadnezzar did is see who God was, see how holy he was, see how powerful he was. Anybody that, that talks bad about God, we're going we're, to we're gonna kill them instead now. He saw the goodness and favor on these three friends' lives. And they were promoted, not just in, in the real world, which they were. They were elevated to a new level with new titles. Sometimes that happens in the world. We're given a new job, better finances, you know. Uh, and, and in these circumstances like these, we need to point towards Jesus. We need to point towards, our, towards the glory that God has. Say, yeah, this wasn't from me. I didn't do this. No matter how hard I work at my job, I, I didn't do this. This was the favor of the Lord, his finger on my life. Because it's through these greatest tests that God will move us forward. And it's not always physically. Most often it's spiritually. These are when we're given the opportunities to grow the most. Is when we're at the bottom of the hill and not the top. When we're at the pit. When we're in the flames. So we need to live a lifestyle that we are persuaded. We are convinced in who God is. That we live in his promises. And that when we, we feel the pressure increase, that we look for his presence. And that, that ultimately we know that we'll be promoted. Those are my five Ps. So do not give up. Know the Lord is not angry with you. Whatever situation you're going through, you are in true, you are truly his beloved. He sees us, his body, corporately as his bride without blemish. He sees us individually as his bride without blemish, as righteous and holy and redeemed. He is not angry with us with what we're going through. Sometimes we need the fire. Sometimes it doesn't feel good, but sometimes it's needed. As a Christian, we have to look at it. As a follower of Christ, this is the only way I can look at it. And it's a hard pill to swallow that if I live, Jesus is with me. And if I die, I get to see Jesus. Nobody wants to deal with that part. This, this if you remember my little video of just the little short end of the rope, that's the life we live here on earth. And the rest of it goes on into eternity. I spend so much time focusing and worrying and doubting and fearing about this little part of my life when I get to live with the Father. So in conclusion, are, are we willing as people, are we willing as followers of Christ to jump into the flames with him? And it's a very tricky question because once we say yes, you know there's going to be fire and you know there's going to be more fire and more fire and more fire because we're going to continue to grow and we're going to continue to be more dependent on Jesus and who he is. The fires will come, but know that we can come out smelling smoke free. One of, one of the things that uh, I remembered while I was, while I was praying and, and trying to sum this up and come to a conclusion is uh, our son got into uh, bladesmithing and forging fire, and, and Jill and I got into the TV series Forged in Fire. He was, my son was actually asked to be on the first season of it, and he turned them down because uh, he's like, I'm not going to be on national television and Netflix uh, working out of my parents' garage with these tools that I got from, handed down from nowhere that are rusty and falling apart. He goes, yeah, so... So the funny story is the guy that ended up winning it was a little Filipino guy that uh, like basically made a forge out of really, it's a really good show, but I don't know why I started with that because it led me into, to when we watched all five seasons of that, uh, Jill and I watched, there was only one season called Iron and Fire, and it's this, this other gentleman that owns a business forging um, antique, antique weapons, and he does everything by hand, and believe it or not, his name's Daniel. 
And, and, and I remember one of the episodes where he, he would take the metal in his hand and, and he'd look at it, he'd heat it up, and he'd chuck it. And, he, and, and then there's other ones that he'd heat it up a little bit and he'd throw it in, in the pile that he'd work on later. And I remember him telling a story. He's like, there's been more blades that I've chucked in the lake than I've probably built. And when, he, when asked why he was doing this, his answer was this. Uh, the, the question they asked is, why is it that you throw some into the junk heap and some over here? And his response is, some metal will be useful when put through the fire, and there's something in it that you can see where the fire refines it, and it, and it becomes perfection. And his, his quote was, but the other metal is useless and it cannot take fire, so I have to toss it over in the junk heap. And there's been so many circumstances in my life that I felt like that junky metal and that I can't be worked with. But I'm telling you, it's in the fire that God sees the things that can't be seen by the human eye and by the naked eye. That he is trying to work out perfection in our lives. We can learn to recognize those difficult situations as tests and trials to prove that I can be perfection in the sight of God. It's in those times that we can look in the mirror and re recite those words that Jerry was saying. I am love. I am and I can be. It's important. It needs to be one of our mottos in life that when we're faced with difficult situations and we, we, then when we're actually given a choice, am I going to follow God in this circumstance or am I going to fall into the world? It's in those, and I'm going to close with this statement. Lord, give me the fire and not the junk heap. So Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, for seeing things in each and every one of us that we can't even see in ourselves. You are an amazing creator, an amazing provider, even in those instances we don't feel the provision. Lord, we thank you for walking through life with us in every circumstance, in every fire, in every flame, in every ripple in the lake, Lord, in every turbid river and in every pit. I ask that it is in those situations in our life that our first response is to look up to you and see who you are. Recognize who you are standing right next to us, going before us, going behind us, completely surrounding us, Lord, and protecting us. Help us understand that you're there in every circumstance. Don't just help us, Lord. Let us see it, see it with our eyes. Let us seek your face and let us find you. Lord, as we go out of here, I ask that everyone looks in the mirrors and see themselves differently today. Give them your eyes so that they can see how loved and how cherished they are. Lord, the steps that you took to ensure that you will see them in eternity in heaven. I thank you for the blood that covers each and every one of us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.